Thank you for joining us. I'm Glenn Richards, Operations Coordinator and local host of Morning Edition on WUFT 89.1, 90.1. On behalf of all the staff here at WUFT, we extend our deepest gratitude for your financial support. Without your donations and without support from our community, WUFT FM would simply have not existed for the past 40 years. And your continued support is vital to our success and to the next 40 years of WUFT FM. From all the staff here at WUFT, we sincerely thank you for joining us today for this special 40th anniversary event. Our special guest really needs no introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway. WUFT FM has been celebrating our 40th anniversary since last September, and a little over 10 years prior, on May 3rd, 1971, All Things Considered made its debut as the first national public radio program. Our guest has been on staff since the network began 15 years ago, 50 years ago, <laughs> making her one of NPR's founding mothers, along with Linda Wertheimer, Nina Totenberg, and the late Cokie Roberts. Beginning in 1972, our guest served as co-host of All Things Considered for 14 years, making her the first woman to anchor a national nightly news program in the United States. She then hosted Weekend Edition Sunday and is now an NPR special correspondent reporting on cultural issues from Morning Edition and Weekend Edition Saturday. Susan Stamberg has won just about every major award in broadcasting. She's been inducted into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame and the National Radio Hall of Fame. In addition to her Hall of Fame inductions, other recognitions include the Armstrong and DuPont Awards, the Edward R. Murrow Award for, from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Ohio State University's Golden Anniversary Director's Award, and the Distinguished Broadcaster Award from the American Women in Radio and Television. She was even awarded a star on the Hollywood <laughs> Walk of Fame on March 3rd, 2020. One of the most popular broadcasters in public radio, she has hosted a number of series on public television, PBS. She's moderated three Fred Rogers television specials for adults, served as commentator, guest, or co-host on various commercial TV programs, and appeared as a narrator in performance with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and the National Symphony Orchestra. Her voice appeared on Broadway in the Wendy Wasserstein play, An American Daughter. Susan Stamberg is the author of two books, Every Night at Five, Susan Stamberg's All Things Considered book, and Talk, NPR's Susan Stamberg Considers All Things. And she's co-editor of a third book, The Wedding Cake in the Middle of the Road, a collection that grew out of a series of stories she commissioned uh, for Weekend Edition Sunday. Prior to joining NPR, she served as program director and producer and general manager of NPR member station WAMU in Washington. And she's had a ton of honorary degrees, prestigious board memberships, and blah, 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 blah. We're so <laughs> thankful that Susan has joined us here to celebrate blah, blah. WUFT's 40th anniversary <laughs> and NPR's 50th anniversary. Please give a virtual round of applause for our special guest, Susan Stamberg. Uh, I will clap for you. I love that introduction, especially the blah, blah part, which was really the most interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks for joining us again to your station. That's just great. Thank you. And happy anniversary to you. When, when yeah. in 1972 did you start uh, with ATC? Uh, I think it was February or March. And so, wow. So it's been 50 years. Yeah. That's yeah. that's pretty awesome. I was there. On, um, I was on the first staff. Linda Wertheimer and I are really the founding mothers. The others, you know, strolled in four or five uh, years later. Yeah, yeah. hangers so on the heavy lifting from the beginning. It was right. great. Yeah, I really enjoyed the fifty and forward special and all the coverage that uh, was going on with with everything last year. Uh, yeah. It was pretty incredible. Um, how was it looking back? I I recognize the roots of it. I guess on occasion at where we are today, how the world has changed. Well, I guess, but the, the world makes me gasp a lot, but that's for other reasons. I must say that we were always, I felt anyway, very ambitious from the very beginning that uh, we would make it, I hoped we'd make a difference uh, in people's lives and a difference to the country by being giving as important and solid and objective information as we could, but we had no resources at all. Um, we had five reporters when we began. These days we've got, I'm sure more than a hundred. I haven't done a nose count lately, but they're everywhere. We had no foreign correspondents, although we had a very good deal, an excellent uh, uh, and very creative arrangement that the uh, first managers made 
with the Christian Science Monitor. I think that newspaper doesn't publish anymore, but in its day, in the 70s, it was a very solid paper and they had reporters everywhere. So they made a deal with them, uh, the NPR people did, and gave us access to all their reporters anywhere. So I could call Wakudugu if there was something going on there and I could spell it and talk to their reporter there and they tell me what was happening. We did that all over the world. So it gave us access, but it didn't give us our own reporting. That didn't happen for a number of years. And Robert Siegel became our first foreign correspondent in, uh, in London. And then it's sort of over the decades boom. But um, it gives me these days just enormous pride, a little sadness for the for the early, uh, not nearly as sleek uh, beginnings. But but there was something wonderful in the in the energy that we had and the ambition that we had. But we played a different role because we uh, really couldn't compete on any level that news was being presented to the United States with no reporters, other using other people's reporters, we couldn't really compete. And there were only three, isn't this amazing, three major television networks then, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And we knew, and that they delivered the news to the nation every night, Walter Cronkite on CBS. Uh, and we knew we couldn't compete with that. So we had to uh, become alternative in a way, look for other ways to do it, do a lot of analysis, use other people's reporters. And that it took a long time to have the money, raise it, earn it, get it from the foundation, charge it in dues to stations like yours before we were able to pay salaries and get enough people in to do it. But it, it's been wonderful just watching it build over the years. Right. I, uh, we've got a bunch of questions from oh, our do. supporters. Okay. But... Uh, one one of our ATC hosts, our local ATC host, uh -huh. uh, you saw him in the video, Dana Hill. He does our classical uh, ah, programming as well. Yeah. He had a question, like, at what point did you know that it was going to work? I mean, because things, like you were sa just saying, were kind of touch and go mm -hmm. in the beginning. When did you know, like, hey, this, this might work? Yeah, I felt it. Um, the dream was always there, as I said, and the ambition from the beginning. But I began to feel it around the time that Frank Mankiewicz, who had been the press spokesman for Bobby Kennedy, Frank was the person who told the world that Kennedy had been shot uh, when he became the president of NPR. And he was very well known nationally. And so he got us a lot of press attention, just his mere appointment. He was familiar to people. The name was familiar, none of ours were. And uh, it sort of, he began to put us on the map, that did it. Uh, so that was in the, I'd say late seventies. I can't give you the specific year, but it, you know, it just took that slow rolling to sort of get there. But at that point I thought, gee whiz, we're, we're, they're really paying attention there. Then we started getting a tremendous amount of press and profiles of us and uh, our pictures on the cover of magazines. It was sort of that, but it was building, building, building. Right. Mankiewicz, uh, so related to Ben Mankiewicz, we were talking about yes, before Ben's we got kid. started here, we were talking about uh, T TCM. So right. that Mankiewicz family, something else. Oh, fantastic. Well, his uh, father wrote, Frank's father wrote Citizen Kane. Yeah. That's great. It's we were great. talking also beforehand, I wanted to follow up. So you, I did not know this before uh, getting prepared for this, that uh, Ari Shapiro is your cousin. Yes, Ari and I. I brag about it all the time. And when we see each other in the hall, it's been a long time. I say, hi, cuz. And he says, hi, cuz back. And here's how that happened. Uh, and I don't think I knew it. Oh, I guess I did know it from the beginning because he wrote a letter to me before he ever came to NPR uh, saying, I hear you have interns who uh, come and do volunteer work for you. I'd love to come and do that. May I? And I wrote him back and said, and there's where he established our, our uh, connection. Uh, but I said, I'd love to do this, but I can't. I can't. I, they just gave me, uh, made it official that I would have an intern who wasn't, got paid a little salary and there's no room to put you and I don't need it. Thank you, but I'd love to meet you someday. So some months uh, after that, Ari shows up at my office 
He's Totenberg's. <laughs> He's Totenberg's intern. He had great ambition, that kid. He really got ahead. And what we discovered was his, he's Shapiro, and my very favorite cousin, Phyllis, was married to Everett Shapiro, who is, I believe, not Ari's father's brother, but they are first cousins. Ari and I are second cousins in law, a couple of times removed, through my, okay. my blood cousin, Phyllis, and his father. Through her and now he's doing ATC. Your old you show. That's awesome. But we love so to now say. you got to get the T-shirt. Uh, I, I doubt you can see this, but you got to look it up. It's on the NPR shop. Ari Shapiro is my co-pilot. I love it. <laughs> How many did you send him? He's going to want dozens of them to hand out. <laughs> He's so good, isn't he? So much fun to listen yeah. to. He's a terrific singer. It, it's great. Uh, you know, and and even as uh, staff, uh, come and go and and uh you know new folks start a martinez on on morning edition and uh it's just always great it's always a really deep bullpen on npr so yeah it's, yeah they're it's cool. very good very solid so a, a lot of our supporters have written in with questions they're very excited uh we're going to start with the first one from helen mccune from gainesville Helen asks, what was one of your favorite interviews? Oh, Lord, I hate that question. Here's the answer. My favorite, my favorite interview is always the next one I'm going to do. Because, you know, more or less that's true. And it's not fair. I've done something like 50,000 interviews in my 50 years at NPR to ask me to pick something. But uh, uh, one that I loved, a chat, it wasn't, well, it was not really an interview, uh, was uh, the car guys. Does anyone remember that car talk? When I, oh, I yeah. put I put Weekend Edition Sunday on the air, and uh, we were looking for elements to put in it, and invited stations like yours to send us air checks of things that they were doing well locally that they thought might work on the network. This was 1987, and Boston sent in a cassette of these two guys. And it made the rounds of the uh, powerhouses at NPR, the suits. Robert Siegel then was our program manager. He had many jobs with us. The, the news director he was. And he listened and he said, oh, uh, I, I have to tell you, there are many versions of this story, but I like mine the best. Siegel said, no, I don't, I don't think so. Then I, I played it for my producer, Kitty Ferguson. She said, oh, no, Susan. These guys, uh, you know, it's, that's not going to work. On a Sunday morning, we want it quiet. You're going to have a, a live pianist in the studio. We want something gentle. And uh, Oh, really? I took it home, played it for my husband. And he said, I don't think that does it, uh, Susan. It's, you know, it's a Sunday morning. It's a much more cultural kind of program. And I said that uh, I said, we're doing this. These guys are fabulous. Those, everybody loves cars. They go out for Sunday drives. It'll work very well on a Sunday morning to hear. They have those accents. They're hilariously funny. We're putting them on the air. And so we did. I take full credit for that. And they started for as in five minute segments uh, on, on Weekend Edition Sunday. And the format was I would be there. I would join them and talk with them as they talked, answered listeners' questions, and they didn't like that one bit. They didn't want some pushy New Yorker coming in there. You know, they, they'd they been on their local air for 10 years, and what did they need this woman to come in and, and uh, uh, mess up their balance? But I was sort of adamant, and what won them over was when I said, I'm the owner of a 1974 Dodge Dart. And Tom, nearly passed out. This was his all-time favorite car. I didn't know that. But the minute he heard that, he said, she's there, bring her on, we'll do it. And then the rest is history. They got their own show and they were, were so popular. They were wonderful to listen to. I'm sure they were on your station, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. we, we oh, kept yeah. playing it uh, for years. Actually, last year, we uh, when NPR said, we're not distributing it anymore. You kept doing it? You we, kept playing them? We kept doing it. Sure, oh, because it, it never gets old. So popular, the listeners loved it. Exactly. And you know what? During the pandemic, it was uh, a, a something, a touchstone of like when things were light. 
And it just was yeah. enjoyable to listen to during yeah. that that whole period. So, so it, it ran its course beautiful. and it was great. Toward the end, that, were, yeah, go ahead. We have rep, yeah. repeats too, NPR was. And a friend said, well, how come they only talk about these really old cars? And they weren't. It was just really old tape. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, it was great. But but that answers our second question from Sandra <laughs> Buckcamp of Lake City. She was asking, how in the world uh, were they chosen? And, um, and, and Greg Peterson asked the same question. Yeah. But uh, wanted to know, was it wisdom or courage, or did you lose some kind of bet? So <laughs> <laughs> thank all of you the for, above. No, they all lost. Thank they you for answering that. Uh, Sandra also had a second question. What prompted you to share Mama Stamberg's cranberry? Oh, good lesson? Lord. The cranberry question. I thought you'd bury that a little bit. Uh, what prompted you? I was do. I was on a station very much like yours. This was my first radio experience, and it's where I learned radio. Uh, WAMU, which also became this powerhouse station in our system today. Uh, but that's where I learned. And Thanksgiving came along and I thought, I had this recipe that I uh, had uh, tasted when I was brought to Allentown, Pennsylvania by my husband who grew up there to be inspected by his parents because we were about to get engaged. And I was brought up there at Thanksgiving and this shocking pink thing was served and I thought it was fabulous. So my mother-in-law-to-be gave me the recipe and I started making it every Thanksgiving and then got a radio job and thought, you know, this is a country in which we're, we move everywhere. We're going, leaving home, we're going other places. We need to have some traditions. And this is a tradition in my house. And why don't I put it on the radio and maybe it will be a tradition for other people too. And when I started at NPR, Many years later, I kept it up, and that's what that's what it was. And now it meets many groans. I have to tell you, in house, which is one of the reasons I'm pleased to be working at home every Thanksgiving. I don't have to listen to all the groan from staff because they roll their eyes and they say, "Oh, here she goes again." But I like being adamant about certain things, and I like having touchstones like that that people remember and will talk about. It's also very delicious, everybody. If you haven't tried it, yeah, I I, I love last year when they played uh, the interview you did, talking about it with members of the band, the Cranberries. <laughs> that was, a, and they're not. I I didn't know anything about them, and I had. I mean, I listened to Gershwin, and who else is here? Rogers and Hard, and Richard Rodgers. So I didn't know who they were, but I liked their music quite a bit. You probably grew up listening to them. Sure. Anyway, that was fun. <laughs> they were not impressed with this recipe. <laughs> that was quite a kick. Yeah. Um, so we've got another question. This is from Kathleen uh, Whiting of Micanopy, Florida. And she asks, how do you keep your sense of humor and your personal balance when our world seems to turn upside down every five minutes and you are of necessity immersed in the news every day? Well, thankfully, I am not anymore. I don't have to anchor any programs. So I'm certainly not as close to the news as I was when I had to be. Uh, but I read the, I read actual newspapers every day. I don't take it off my computer. And I just find myself, even with the newspapers, just turning the pages so much faster than I ever have. Because it's really very hard to keep up with, so, with the number of disasters that we're living in the middle of. of. But, you know, laughter is the best medicine. And if you can't laugh, and so much is absurd that happens, uh, where are you, really? And anyway, I, I love to laugh. And I think it's laughing is very good for us. And we certainly need breaks from all of this. So I do what I can. NPR does a good job of finding the odd story to uh, break up yes, the monotony. I've so. noticed that. That's a, that's a difference and it's really a step back to how uh, we were in the early days when we did uh, a whole lot more lighter things, again, because we didn't really have a news division. But particularly in the years of the, of the Trump administration, it was such relentless news. It was day after day and all the twits, the Twitters and all of that, that there was very little room for that lighter stuff. Uh, I, I hear now that it's, I can hear on our radio, that uh, it's there, it's breathing again. They're admitting 
The news right. is not as relentless, although it's certainly dark. But but they're allowing the programs to breathe more, and we need that. Your stories help uh, do that too. Uh, all of your your stories, whenever there's an art opening or 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 something. Yeah, this I enjoy year, those. And we've all been working from home. Headquarters are uh, closed, so I've switched because I'm finding I'm really not much of a techie, and I found it very complicated and hard to deal with the equipment I needed to do. I'm starting to, again, with a lot of help from the NPR people, uh, that I needed to actually broadcast and uh, we weren't going out to do it. And I, how do you do it with masks and long fishbowl microphones and all? So I started writing a column for the web page, And that was one, it personally was wonderful for me because it gave, it was a real stretch. And I had to learn a whole new discipline and how to use actual images rather than having to describe the paintings as I do in my reporting. So that's been great. And now I'm getting back to doing some more radio things. They're not up to my standards, so they don't sound as good. And I don't have the engineers, you know, walk in a studio, it gets gorgeously recorded. And people do the mixing and really make it sound so wonderful. Don't, that doesn't happen I'm with me. Another question. Uh, this is another one from Gainesville. John Reskin, uh, Reeskin asks, um, what was your most aggravating experience in your career at NPR? In my whole career? Besides people asking what your most favorite interview was. <laughs> yeah, aggravating, aggravating. Well, uh, I get aggravated these days for not having an engineer to go see and go step in a studio. I don't know, aggravating. I'll tell you, puzzling. And it's about Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Who did you tell me was from Gainesville? Stephen Stills. Uh, okay, spent Stills. a couple of years here and a couple of bands and was at Gainesville High School with uh, uh, Don Felder. They were in a band uh -huh. together. Okay, well, it wasn't, it, it wasn't Stills. It was Crosby, David Crosby, who had just written a book. And I was, it was a book interview. He was going around the country being interviewed in, trying to sell books. Uh, and I went over to my, who was my partner in NTC then. Uh, no, this was for the Sunday program, but he was, uh, Noah was still there, Noah Adams, uh, who was a big fan of theirs. And I said, uh, uh, Crosby's coming, what do you suggest? Because again, it was not my music. And he said, Susan, ask him, because he'd been in jail, he spent, he'd done jail time for uh, drug use. And he wrote, that was very clear in the book. He wrote about it at length. He said, just ask, say to him, it, it looks so glamorous and fabulous to see you all on the stage performing. Anybody who looks at you thinks, oh my God. And if this is from a drug high, well, why don't we do it too? I said, that's a really good question. And he'll have a provocative and interesting answer. So I did, I asked him. We were, we were chatting away and having a wonderful time, Crosby and I, and I asked him Noah's question, and he got up and walked out of the studio. Wow. He was in, new, in our New York bureau, and I was in D.C., so I didn't see him, but I said, what, hello, what's happening? The engineer in New York said he left. He got up and left. So I thought that was very peculiar. Luckily, we were taping. It wasn't live. Uh, but I went and told Noah, and and uh, we talked about what could have been going on, what could have happened. And I said, you know what, let's do this on the radio. Let's play the tape as far as it goes. And then you come in the studio, let me tell you the story about how he got up and walked out. And then let's just talk about it, which I thought was a good idea. It was, you know, it would have been very interesting to listen to, or we may have come up with some good theories. It clearly, it was all speculation. I mean, who knew? couldn't get into his mind, um, especially since, you know, I wasn't revealing anything. He had written, he had written about the glamour of it and the dangers of it. And surely I was going to head him toward that after he finished uh, whatever his theory was or his, his reason. But the producer of the day said, no, that I don't want that. Let's not put that on the air. That won't work. And I, I, I listened to him and I was wrong. I should have but it was puzzling. I, I wouldn't call it aggravating. It was just, huh? You know, not knowing the answer to this day still annoys me. <laughs> Interesting, oh. though, isn't it? Send him a note. Ask him. Say, yeah. hey, 
David, do you remember? And <laughs> see what he said. He might be walked out on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, okay. Um, we're going to open the mic and let one of our listeners and supporters uh, ask a question. Ruth oh, Steiner from Gainesville. Okay. Hi, Ruth. Let's see if this works. Hi. Oh, there you are. The question is, what do you consider to be the greatest challenges for National Public Radio in the next decade? Oh, well, technology again and keeping up with it. Um, it feels to me, uh, I don't, I'm not happy to say this, but I think it's, it's pretty close, that we are headed toward a time when we won't be doing these uh, magazine strip news broadcasts anymore. We seem to be, uh, first of all, they're very expensive because it's a, takes, a, you can imagine, the kind of staff it takes all over the world to be able to deliver news at that level. And we've been doing it this way uh, uh, for years at this high level, but now with an enormous sense of responsibility be, because of the demise of newspapers. We used to be, uh, as I was saying, um, second day analysts on uh, all things considered, but now we are so many people, millions of people, primary news source, because there's nobody else that is doing it at our level. The newspapers can't, they don't, just don't have the staff. Uh, local papers have shrunk that, or, or gone out of business altogether. So the responsibility is far, far greater. Um, and, and we've, the fundraising for it has continued and, and worked pretty well. But I suspect that we're in this age of podcasts now, when people are uh, wanting to on demand hear what interests them, not sit through our, our attention spans have shrunk as well, not sit through a two hour broadcast, uh, that, that that's where, where we'll be headed. And I don't know with all these new outlets and possibilities and platforms, a word in my youth meant a style of shoe that you wore that made you taller or more glamorous or made your legs look better, platform heels. But no, now we're talking about all these other ways that people can consume sound. So I think that that will be a very big challenge to keep them of the quality uh, that our daily news broadcasts are. And I worry too about people just not being as well informed by only listening to things they want to hear rather than things that I feel they need to hear, that they should hear to get a sense of the parameters of our world, which are getting very complicated as well. Yeah. So it's a worry. Well, I'm encouraged when I look at uh, like, you know, data about podcasts like the the most popular podcasts and and things like that and it's public media by far uh yes, it, it's quality over quantity because you'll you can yeah. look and see like the commercial ones like barstool sports or iheart media they have like twice as many podcasts yeah. as uh wnyc npr apm etc yeah. but invariably the most downloaded and listened to or streamed are, are this American life uh, up first from NPR, yeah. um, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. NPR They're one. always, it's the public media producer. So people crave our content and they're yes. craving it in new ways. So, yes. you know, they're still coming to the radio for it. Uh, um, but they're they're also like yeah listening to the podcast when they can um mm -hmm. i mean up first which is uh the morning edition podcast yes. is uh very successful and now yeah. consider this the atc podcast so i think you know npr seems to be doing a good job of of staying current with those trends and keeping make, an eye on it they also make a lot of money they pull in money through advertising which uh as opposed to the underwriting that we do for radio there right they put actual ads up on there and so it's a yeah. for the company as well and and now the subscription service so it's interesting mm -hmm. uh to see mm -hmm. where it goes but i'm encouraged because uh we're we're in the mix you know very very strongly so very that, that gives me hope because people are interested and plus young people 
are coming into yes. contact with the public media content uh, through so much, uh, so many podcasts, uh, yes. niche podcasts. And, and it's kind of cool that some of them have become radio shows, you know, uh, like yes, the exactly. daily, uh, from APM through line, uh, code switch and life kit yeah. converted into radio shows. So, yeah. um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, Linda Bobroff from Newberry, she actually, I think we answered her question uh, when you were talking about your most challenging interview or when you were talking about David Crosby, That's that was her question. But she wanted to uh, say that they love Mama Stamberg Cranberry. Oh, Ranch. good. Oh, she has perfect taste. Linda and Newberry. Thank you. I want to say hello uh, to my friend Shelly, even if she's not going to ask a question. Uh, Carla Oliver from Gainesville. What was your favorite subject, genre, person uh, that you enjoy exploring most on NPR? Well, always artists. I mean, my duty was as the news anchor to do the news every day and talk to news sources. I never liked talking to politicians uh, because they would never tell me anything. They wouldn't tell 7,000 other people. And they have to be so careful. They have to watch their words because they, they get... Uh, votes may depend on it; they may win or lose them. So uh, that that's not in my in my pl on my plus this plus side of my uh, notebook. But it's always the artists, and it was the creative people that got me through every single news day. Really, if if I knew that that day I would have a chance to talk to a singer or a composer or a painter or a dramatist, you know, then that was something that was like the icing on the cake for me. And it still is. It's why I still do so much on the arts. And I've been that way since I was a kid. Uh, David Taroli from Ocala. He writes, uh, how do you maintain objectivity when you were doing the news, particularly if you've got a strong opinion one way or the other? Well, uh, that's a good question for everybody on our staff, uh, all, the, all the reporters, all the hosts, all the broadcasters. That's what it's about. I mean, that's the job description. Essentially, uh, Bob Edwards used to say, uh, he, he was my partner on All Things Considered for a number of years before he went to, to anchor Morning Edition. And, and he used to say, objectivity, you have to work at all the time. But the real goal is to be fair. You'll always have an opinion about something. You, and so what you do is keep the, the opinion for yourself, but ask pointed enough questions that you get a response to, to it. But fairness, that's non-negotiable. And uh, that, that need to find the balance and work toward it every single day, that's the job description. So you, you sort of come in knowing that. All right, thank you. Uh, Kim E. Hankins from Gainesville, Florida. She asks, how did you develop your deep interest in art? Uh, I, as a kid, uh, I would sit at the kitchen table in Manhattan where I grew up uh, with the radio on, because that was the medium of my childhood, and a paint box and some paper in front of me. So I made art from a very young age. I went to an incredible high school in Manhattan, the High School of Music and Art. It's called, uh, these days, LaGuardia, after one of the great mayors of, of Manhattan. Uh, and I went as an art student, where you had three classes a day, in making art, as well as a full academic schedule. I bet you've got such a school in Gainesville or some nearby town. Um, so it, it was in my DNA from, from the start. Uh, and I never let it go. Uh, when I travel, I, I keep a journal and I just sit and sketch. I'll sit in a cafe and just stretch uh, sketch a building that's just across from me that catches my eye. Uh, the, ske the sketches were better than they are <laughs> these days. Well, I'm not traveling. Uh, maybe when I get back to it. But uh, always I was sur surrounded by artists and musicians in that high school. And that made an enormous difference in my life, in my tastes, in, uh, in, in my approach to life, really. And the way I look at things and a craving for it. And I I've never let it go. It still is that for me. Yeah, art's a big part of my life, too. Uh -huh. um, my parents were both musicians, uh -huh. and I thought I was going to be an artist when I was in high school. That's what I was doing. But then I was uh, spending more time 
planning out what I was going to listen to while I painted that, uh-huh. <laughs> that uh, yes. it was recommended that maybe I should be a DJ or something. Uh, uh-huh. So I'll tell you, uh, uh, I think I'm, this is maybe I consider this my best contribution to NPR, even better than the finding the car guys or the puzzle wheel shorts on Sundays. Um, and it was right after 9-11. I was home listening and I'm and just like this, as we all were after the, that terrible tragedy. And I noticed that listening to Morning Edition, every time they played one of those little musical, we call them buttons, between stories, it made me feel differently. I could relax a little bit and uh, get my mind off it a bit. And so I went in to work and I told that to the executive producer. And I said, here's something I'd like to do on Morning Edition. This was days after the, uh, the planes, the towers fell. I said, give me two minutes every day. And uh, I, let me talk, ask the finest musicians in this country what they would like America to be listening to right now. And she, to her credit, because it was a, a bizarre request in the middle of all of that. And we were flurry, you know, scrambling to get the news on. She said, yes. And so I started, the first one was uh, a pianist. Oh, and it really, it makes me weepy even now to tell it to you. It was Leon Fleischer. Uh, he, he wanted to hear, wanted us all to hear uh, Beethoven's fifth, the uh, last movement of it. The, the joy, joy that spurned, flame immortal that. He said it's about brotherhood and about, uh, and about peace. And we need to hear that now. And we listened, we listened to it for about a minute. It got shorter as time went by, but I got Beverly Sills, the great opera singer, and uh, Joni Mitchell and uh, uh, Quincy Jones, just an enormous range of musicians uh, to come on. And each one chose something completely different, but that was important to their lives. And we did that for a couple of weeks, actually. And then, you know, it was enough. Things moved on, we could stop. But I just felt, uh, you know, I don't believe in the arts as therapy, but I do believe in getting your mind something, what they do is how they lift us and take us to some other place, take our mind off what we have to do in the moment. And I feel it, and that's looking at art, the visual arts, hearing wonderful music, reading a great book, it clears the mind. Uh, you know, it, it takes you away from, to, from this minute and clears it so that you can go back refreshed and deal with the things that you have to do. I bet you agree with that, Glenn. I do. And depending upon the piece of music, it can transport you to another time and place. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been listening to a yeah. lot of music lately, I tell you. <laughs> I hope Biden is. <laughs> the power of, uh, of music and, and art uh, to do that. Uh, we've got another question. Um, so Steve Kern, he, he's a, a longtime professor here at UF. And, uh-huh. and longtime supporter for us comes in and does our our uh, fundraising uh, with us. Um, mm-hmm. So he said, NPR radio voices quote sound unquote increasingly diverse, featuring women and men with accents uh, and with speaking styles that suggest different backgrounds, regions, nationality, nationalities, which is great. How does your own experience of having to fight for your own early roles, as you have expressed in books and interviews? Uh, inform new generations of aspiring journalists? Uh huh. That's a, a lovely question. And also, I love how uh, our sound is changing. I love accents. I love local and regional accents. I love to hear them. Uh, so it's, and, and for a long time, we lost that. I'm a New Yorker. And uh, of course, I know that you think I'm a Southern belle from the way I, <laughs> from the way I speak. South Manhattan. <laughs> but, <laughs> But uh, I guess I worked very hard to get rid of my New York accent. And there was a time when you did that. There was sort of a national accent that uh, many broadcasters had. And I love, I love uh, that we're getting back to that. And also we're, we're broadcasting that kind of diversity. 
Um, I, I'm not so crazy about the very young women who end sentences like this, as if everyone is asking a question rather than making a the vocal fry. Statement. Yeah. Oh, fry. Is that fry? Yeah. And yeah, I think that needs you. a little bit of work. But uh, because I keep thinking someone answer her question, for gosh sake, come on, give her an answer. <laughs> but uh, but I do. I like the variety very much. And when I started, uh, because there were no role models for me, there were no women anchoring news broadcasts. Uh, so I, I thought I better sound, I have to sound like the men. And so I started speaking with a very deep voice, and, you know, trying, trying to mimic them. I'm sure it sounded ridiculous. And Bill Seamering, who was the person who really created All Things Considered, he was our first program manager, said to me fairly early on, uh, two words that have made all the difference in my life then. He said, be yourself. Nobody ever says that to you, you know, except Mr. Rogers used to say, be yourself. But otherwise they say, sit up straight or go on a diet or comb your hair or this something to change your shirt. But he said, be yourself. And it was such a gift because he wanted that sound. He heard in, in me, this, in a hallway, what he wanted to hear on the air and not somebody imitating ridiculously somebody else and it created the sound of npr yeah very definitely uh i mean national public radio it's the public you know what you sound it like is. the general public you can hear the public and that was a real priority from the beginning well it's it's been working for 50 years and it looks like it's gonna uh keep going for another 50 it may be very different as you uh opine yeah. but um, I think it'll be there in one form or another. I do. And There'll always so be once voices again, telling stories. Well, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Congratulations once again. Uh, oh, you too. On, on to, to your, your station. anniversary. And thank you. Uh, any final words for our, our members that have gathered? Um, you're wonderful supporters of this station, obviously, for what people were saying. And, uh, and that's just so important and so valued. Please keep that up and listen as carefully as you obviously are doing and tell us when we're doing well and tell us when we're not. We need that too. And thank you, Glenn. It yep. was great fun to talk. Very nice to talk to you. Uh, very nice to talk to you too. Uh, we'd like to thank you for uh, your time today for, for joining us uh, for uh, this 40th anniversary event. We also want to thank our WUFT supporters and community that have joined us on this Zoom today. Um, and also want to thank a couple of individuals who helped make this possible. Matt Abramson, Lorenzo, I'm going to get it wrong, Pasava, uh, Miguel Miranda, uh, Erica Henderson, Natalie Kara Oglanian, uh, Randy Wright, the College of Journalism and Communications Dean Hub Brown, uh, Kayla Mize, uh, who's here as well, and Emily Dagger, and of course, Susan Stanberg, thank you so much for, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. We're thankful for all the work you've done for public media and uh, your work to help shape it for what it is, uh, what it is for us today. Um, and for uh, our supporters who are on there, please remember that uh, UF Giving Day is tomorrow. And if you can, please show your support. Um, we appreciate it. And Thank you. And write to David Crosby. That may be a good story. You may get him on the air. And <laughs> I'd know. love to hear that follow up on, uh, on Morning Edition. <laughs> Maybe so. All right. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. This is fun. Bye-bye. Bye.